something special about himself, a special power, a special attribute, a special character there. And just imagine more than thousand names. Some people ask why more than thousand names? Because in this life we face more than a thousand problems. So what is the message? What is God saying through this scripture to you and me? That for every crisis that we face, God has a name and God reveals that name to us. And the revelation of that name gives us victory and success over that particular crisis that we face. But the thing is this. See, God has to take the initiative. Unless God reveals it, we cannot understand it. See, these are spiritual truths. They have to be spiritually discerned. You cannot understand it with your natural mind or your natural thinking or capabilities. See, oftentimes, this is what we think. We think that we can understand the word of God without God's help. But one of the reasons why Jesus said, I go away, but I will send you another person, the comforter. And God goes on to describe the Holy Spirit and the various works that he will do, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that God says the Holy Spirit will do when he comes, that he will guide us into all truth. That means he will give a revelation of truth. He will help us to understand the scriptures when we read it. See, if you try to understand it without the help of the Holy Spirit, you will never get it. You will miss out. You will have just a superficial knowledge of the scriptures. So that is why God has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us revelation. He's the one who illuminates our hearts and minds with the scriptures, opens it up and helps us to understand it in the way that we need to understand it. That is why we are always dependent upon him. Without him, we cannot understand it here. So this is what God is saying. Unless he reveals, we will understand the power that there is in every name. And the thing is this, unless God reveals, so God has to take the initiative. That means it tells me that every time I'm in a crisis, every time I face a problem, a different problem in life, God comes to me. See, he takes the initiative. That is why I like the Bible where the verse says this, I will answer even before they could call. See, when God sees you in a crisis, he doesn't wait for you to call upon him. He sees it. The Bible says his eyes are upon the righteous there. He sees your crisis and even before you could call for help, he already has taken the initiative. That is what it means here. I will reveal. So every time I get myself in a new crisis or a new problem there, God doesn't wait for me to cry out there for help there. No, he sees it. He's my father. He loves me. He cares for me. And he comes and he reveals himself in a fresh way to me, reveals a special attribute or special power. And that revelation causes me to have success in victory over that particular crisis that I'm going to. So God takes the initiative. And that is what I appreciate there. It's wonderful that he takes the initiative. Now the message Bible says there, it's time my people come to know who I am. I think Christian people should wake up. <laughs> we are living in the last days and we need to wake up. You know, it's more than 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ came into this earth there. And he came to reveal the Father. And he preached and he thought with great authority and power. He healed every sickness and disease. The thing is this. Jesus came not only to reveal the Father, but he also came how to show us how you and me need to live. We need to live with great authority and power. This is what he thought through his preaching and teaching. How we have authority and power over every sickness, every disease, and every work of the enemy there. In other words, he came to show us what the Christian life is about. See, this is what Jesus came to show. He came to reveal the Father, came to reveal what the Christian life is. But today, Christians still hold on to traditions. They are still filled with traditional knowledge, religious knowledge, presumptions and assumptions about God that they miss out on the abundant life that Jesus came to show how to live it and how to enjoy it there. So that is why I like the, what the Message Bible says. It says, it's time my people come to know who I am really. You know, even till today, there are many people think that they cannot know the will of God. They think they cannot know God's heart and God's mind. They cannot know, have any knowledge of God. They say, how can we know God? Many Christian people think that. But the thing is this, God has revealed whatever we need to know about him here in the scriptures there. So you can have a precise, exact knowledge about God through the word. Apart from the word, all you will have is presumptions and assumptions and just religious ideas or thought about what God is or who he is. Precise knowledge of God is only through the scriptures. God has revealed 
everything that you and me need to know about him in the scriptures here. So that is why we are going to the scriptures and we are looking at the names of God. We are talking about the names of God. We looked at several names. We looked at the name Elohim and through that we saw how God reveals himself as a creator. Then we looked at Jehovah, how he reveals himself as a self-existing, self-revealing God. God who never changes. He exists by himself. Nobody created him. In the beginning was God. That is what we see in there. Then we looked at El Shaddai, the one who nurtures and nourishes and satisfies with abundance. We looked at Adonai, where God is the rightful owner. All that you and me possess actually is of God. So we are stewards of God. We don't own anything. Everything he owns there. Then we looked at Jehovah Jireh, the one who foresees our needs and makes abundant provision there. We looked at Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals us. Heals not only our spiritual diseases, but every sickness and disease there. We looked at Jehovah Nissi, the one who always gives us victory in every situation and circumstance. We looked at Mekadesh, the Lord who sanctifies. And the last name that we looked at is Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. See, the thing is, you see a progressive revelation of God in the scriptures here. Revelation is always progressive. In the old times, they understood little. Little by little, God revealed himself. You may ask why God reveals himself little by little. The problem is because he cannot reveal himself fully at one time. We will never grasp it. So, revelation is always progressive. You may ask why God reveals himself little by little. Because God is an infinite being. <laughs> he cannot reveal everything about himself just like that to you in a moment. And even if he does... Your mind will never understand it, never grasp it. So that is why revelation is progressive there. So we see here that through these names, God reveals himself step by step. And every time he comes, when his people are in a crisis there, in a new crisis, every time they face a new crisis, God comes there and he takes the initiative and he reveals himself in different names there. And the revelation of those names is what gives them victory and success over the particular crisis that the nation of Israel faced there. So we looked at all these names. And what does it tell you and me today? This is what it tells us. That when we face crisis, when we face problems in our life, not to panic, not to fear, to expect God to show up. Because God says, I will come and I will reveal my name to my people. That means when you're in a crisis, God will come to you and he'll reveal something special about himself. And that revelation will what brings you success and victory over the particular crisis that you face in your life there. So you don't have to worry about crisis. All you have to do is look to God and expect him to reveal himself through your crisis there. Because the answer is in God, not in the crisis there. So now we are going to look today, I'm going to introduce you to a new name uh, called Jehovah Sikinu. It means the Lord of our righteousness. Now this name is revealed to Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. So let us turn to Jeremiah 23. I'll read verse 5 and verse 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. And you will have there in capital letters there, the Lord our righteousness. This is the word, Jehovah Sikinu, the Hebrew word that has been translated as the Lord of Righteousness. Now, here God comes to Jeremiah when the people of Israel are facing a new crisis there. And God reveals himself in a new way. They have experienced him as Elohim. They have experienced him as Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah Rophe, Jehovah Shalom, all that. But they have never experienced him in this manner. Jehovah sickened you, the Lord, their righteousness. So they are in a new crisis and God is coming to them there and revealing himself in a new way. And this is what he reveals himself to as the Lord, our righteousness here. Now, first of all, let me tell you that this topic, righteousness, it by itself is a big subject. You know, I will deal with it in, in, in another teaching. It's a big teaching there. Because when you talk about righteousness, you know there are two types of righteousness. Then how does one become righteous? It's a big subject. There are another topic. And maybe I'll take it up and deal with it uh, when I talk on righteousness as a subject here. But uh, I'm just going to deal with righteousness in connection 
to the context in which we are looking at righteousness and connected to the name here jehovah sick in you so i'm going to confine myself to the context in which we are looking at here so let us go back to that scripture and say here it says here the lord our righteousness so first thing we need to understand here that god is speaking about the righteousness that god is speaking about does not come out of you or me no he's not talking about our righteousness he's not talking about your good deeds eh? or your good you know whatever good you do your sacrifices and all those things that makes you a righteous person before god he's not talking about those things not talking about your good works your sacrifices that you do try to earn a good name from god no no he's talking about the lord our righteousness in other words instead of talking about my righteousness that i gain or i earn from god it is talking about a righteousness that comes from god where he gives it freely i cannot earn it i cannot work for it there is nothing that i can do to get that righteousness that is what it's talking about see the moment you talk about righteousness lot of people talk about earning it they think about doing good deeds being honest all that is good as a christian we have to be good we have to do good we have to be honest we have to be just all those things are included there but just because you are good and do good deeds and sacrifice and do a lot of good works does not make you a righteous person it does not earn god's righteousness you don't become righteous by that because the bible is very clear that our righteousness is as filthy as rags before god see the standard of god's righteousness is very high if you try to measure up with your righteousness and put it to god's righteousness you will come nowhere the only way we can measure our righteousness by comparing ourselves <laughs> hello we look at other people and say yeah i am a little better than him that's how we can compare other person looks at oh i am little better than person see we can compare with each other but you cannot compare yourself with god because god's righteousness is very high his standard is very high we will never measure up to that standard we will never meet that standard of righteousness no matter how much a good works we do no matter how much sacrifices you make you cannot become righteous by that this righteousness comes from god it is a gift when you accept christ when you confess jesus as your lord christ becomes your wisdom he becomes your righteousness so it comes to you as a gift of god he gives you his righteousness that is what it's talking about here god's righteousness clothed with the garments of righteousness this is what every believer receives when he puts his faith in christ a great exchange takes place jesus takes away our sin he takes away you know all the curses everything there and he gives us many things and one of the things he does is he clothes us with a garment of righteousness from head to foot we are clothed with righteousness so this righteousness that is talking about here in jeremiah is a righteousness that comes from god as a free gift to you and me here so the word jehovah sick in you the lord our righteousness is translated in different words basically it means the quality of being right with god it's a picture of a man being right with god by trusting god and believing god for his righteousness that's what this word means <laughs> so it's not talking about man's righteousness where he earns or where he gets it by his good deeds or good works or good sacrifice no no that word implies it gives a picture of a man who's trusting god and believing god and by trusting and believing god receives by faith god's own righteousness he is clothed by faith with god's own righteousness that is the implication here that is the picture here of this word jehovah sick in you here it is also translated as right righteous righteousness just justify and as declare innocent now all these words mean something what it means it not only it not only implies the righteousness that comes from god but it also implies that when you get this righteousness from god you will live right you will live righteous you will live in a just way this is what it means here if you read verses 5 and 6 of jeremiah 23 you will understand that 
It says here, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. So God is talking about a coming, a time that will come when a seed of David will be raised up, a branch of David will be raised up. He says, David, a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper. And then he says, execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. That means a king will come up and he will reign and execute judgment and righteousness. That means he will rule and govern in a righteous manner or in a righteous way there. And then in verse 6 says there, and in his days, Judah will be saved. Oh, I'll read the second part of verse 5. And execute judgment and righteousness in this earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will be safely. Now this is his name, which he is called. So the implication is not just receiving a righteousness of God. This righteousness will cause you to live righteously, to rule righteously, to govern righteously, and to, just, to do just works and good works. That is what it's talking about here. So this is the meaning of this word, Jehovah sick in you. Now, the thing is, we'll never understand the meaning and the significance of the name until we understand the occasion. See, that is why for me, always the background and the occasion in which this name is revealed is very important. When you understand that, that is when you understand the significance and the real depth of the meaning of this word here. So let us go to Jeremiah 23 and let us look at the occasion in which God reveals this name to Jeremiah, the prophet here. If you're ever feeling depressed in life, don't ever read the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> It'll make you more depressed. <laughs> it's one of the books, you know, that is so depressing. So don't ever read it when you're depressed there. But let us go here to the book of Jeremiah because it is in this depressing book that God come to, comes to this depressing prophet Jeremiah and reveals this wonderful name, the Lord, our righteousness there. So... The background is this. Now, let us say we are suffering from some health issue. We have a health problem or an health issue. And you go to a doctor. And then the doctor, you know, he diagnoses your health issue. And then he begins to address your problem. And he prescribes the solution to your problem. He diagnoses your problem. And he prescribes the solution to your problem. And the thing is, you don't like a solution <laughs> because you never expected that solution. You can't just do it. You don't put it up. You can't put up with this solution there. What do you do? I'll tell you what we'll do. We will simply switch doctors. That is what we will do. <laughs> no, some people, I know many people, especially diabetic, heart patients, when they go to a doctor, they have a health issue. They go to a doctor there. And the first thing the doctor, he will analyze the sickness there and he will prescribe a solution for them. So he says, if you're a diabetic, stay away from sugar, stay away from sweets, don't eat cakes, don't eat, you know, chocolates. And you know what? Some people don't like it. If you're suffering from cholesterol and if you have a heart issue, then he will address that. He will say, don't eat mutton, don't eat fatty foods. <laughs> but the thing is, many people don't like the solution that he gives. He's diagnosed your problem. He's found the issue with you. And now he's prescribing a solution. And that is the only thing that can heal you and restore your health. But the problem is you don't like his solution because you like the fat. <laughs> Hello? You know, in those days when we cook, let it be anything. Whatever curry you cook, fish curry or thing, oil should be floating on top of the curry. Only then the taste will be there. The fat should melt and that oil should float there. Then only we like it. If there's no oil floating, we will not like it there. So we like eating like that. And if the doctor says, well, you have a heart problem, you have a cholesterol problem, you have to stay away from this, immediately some people get angry. They don't like it. So what they do? They switch doctors. They try to go and find another doctor which puts up with all their logic. <laughs> he says, well, it doesn't matter what you eat. It's okay. I'll treat you. They'll go and find such a doctor. Now, this is the situation and occasion that was happening to Israel. And this is exactly what the nation of Israel was doing here. This is the background here. Israel were doing just what you and me will do there. They had a problem. They cannot go to Jehovah. 
because if they go to jehovah the one and only true living god he will diagnose the problem and he will give them the solution and you know what they didn't like the solution <laughs> because it was not favorable to them jehovah was saying some things which they didn't want to do there so what they did is instead of listening and taking the solution that the one and only true god jehovah is offering them for their problem there they turn their backs on jehovah and go to another god they go to other gods their foreign gods just like how you and me we don't like what the doctor has diagnosed there we don't like the solution that is prescribed prescribed there so what we do because we don't like it we just turn our backs on him and we try to find another doctor that will give a favorable diet for you and me that is exactly what the nation of israel is doing here they have declined turn their backs on god now they cannot go to him because if they go to him he will tell them exactly where they need to repent and what they need to do they didn't like it they didn't want his advice they didn't want a solution there so that is why they turned their back on the one and only true living god and they went and sought after foreign gods why because the foreign gods didn't care or didn't worry how they lived and what they did <laughs> foreign gods didn't worry about their moral issues didn't worry about you know you can do what you want you can eat what you want you can live any way and every way we don't care that's how the foreign gods were but with jehovah it's not like that he's a living god one and only true god if you come to him then you have to live how he tells you to live you just cannot live how you wish and how you desire to live you cannot say it's my life i'll do what i want but that is exactly what the nation of israel was doing here So this is the background. Israel had departed from God, the one and only true God. They were following foreign gods, worshiping other foreign gods and accepting other gods there simply because the foreign gods put up with all their immoral issues and all those things there. And that is why they worshiped those gods because those gods were lenient with the nation of Israel. It didn't matter or worry to them what Israel did, whether they did evil or they lived immoral, all those things, those gods were. were not worried about because they didn't care about those things there so this is the background in which god comes to jeremiah but if you read the book of jeremiah especially here in jeremiah chapter 23 you will see there that jeremiah chronicles a time when judah the southern kingdom was wandering away from god and experiencing decline and deterioration now some of you if you know biblical history you will know at a point of time that Israel was divided into two northern kingdom and southern kingdom they were divided into two there so judah was the southern kingdom here so judah the southern kingdom wandered away from god and was experiencing decline and deterioration that means the moment they put turn their backs on god and went away from god there they begin to experience decline they begin to wither away spiritually and they became spiritually dead and they deteriorated there Israel was a northern kingdom so had long departed from God and had been deported by the Assyrian king that means Israel before Judah itself they turned their backs on God and because of them they were deported by the king of Assyria that means he captured them and he kept them under his power there now the remaining of God's people they were about to go on a judgment to the king of babylon because they too by choice have chosen to turn their backs on god and walk away from him and go to foreign gods and worship foreign gods now this is the background and the context so we see here judah the southern kingdom they turn their backs on god depart from god and go away from him what happens there is a decline deterioration there then we see israel the northern kingdom they also turn their backs from god walk away from him same thing decline deterioration remaining of god's people what happens to them they also go on a judgment because of that decline and deterioration they go on a judgment there the babylonian king was about to take them as captives there so this was a condition of the nation of israel now when you look at this state and the condition here it may seem as if because if you read there about judah and israel and the remaining people here going under the judgment of god the moment we read going under of judgment of god it may seem to you 
that God is punishing them, that God is the one who is sending them as captive to be overtaken by Assyrian and Babylon, so they may be captivated there. It may seem as if God is the one who is doing this. A lot of people believe that God is the one who pours judgment. Now, I believe in the judgments of God. We do have judgments of God in the Bible. That is God's judgment in history. Why God poured out his judgments, for example, Sodom and Gomorrah, eh? there are times there. Why God poured out his judgment in history is because God wants to show man that sin will be punished and there will be a judgment. To teach man in history, that is why God in history pours out his judgment there. To teach man that in eternity there will be a judgment there. Why? For whatever man does. That is why his judgments in history. But people think that every time that God's people do wrong, God immediately pours out his wrath and judgment and God is the one who punishes them and sends them into captivity because when you read the verses, it looks like that. If you read here, this is what it looks like. It looks like as if God is sending Israel on the remaining people into captivity to the Babylonian king. As if God is making them do it. God is sending them there. It looks like that. But I want to tell you that God doesn't always pose out his judgment on people in this manner, like this manner here. <laughs> He's not a God where you turn your back on him and if you do wrong, he pours out judgment, he pours out his wrath and fury upon you or, you know, he makes you become a captive and a slave. No, no, he's not a God like that because, see, scripture has to be balanced. Jesus said, he that comes to me, no wise I will cast away. No wise I will cast away. That means even if you turn your back on him, he will not turn your back on you. It's possible for you and me to fail God, I always say it. It's possible for us to turn our backs on God and walk away from him. But God will never do it because he's given us his word. He that comes unto me, he says, I will not cast him away. In other words, he will be saved to the uttermost. God will save him. When we give our life to Jesus, it is his duty to keep us safe and sound until eternity. That is why Jesus prayed to the Father. He says, all the people that you give to me, I will give back to you. Nobody can snatch them out of my hand. See, the moment you come to Jesus, you come into his hand, you put your life into his hand, there is no power or no devil that can snatch you out from his grip or from him. Nobody can take you out. So how do we understand this scripture where it says there that the remaining people went into captivity, Babylonian captivity there, and God's judgment was about to be poured out on the remaining people. Well, this is how we need to understand it. See, first thing here, we learn a fundamental principle. What is the principle is, when you read Israel's history, especially this particular time of period of history here, we learn one thing is, because remember, whatever happened to the nation of Israel happened to you and me so that we may learn from them and not commit the same mistake and same blunders like they did there. That is why everything is recorded, even their mistakes and faults are recorded, so that we may learn from it. So what is the principle that we learn from this period of Israel, where there is a decline and deterioration, and the more they turn their backs on God and walk away from God, the more they decline and the more they deteriorate. So what is the fundamental principle that you and me learn? Well, the first thing we learn is this. The further you depart from God, the more you invite declination and deterioration. Now you understand it. See, it's like this. Just because you turn your back on God and you walk away from God, God doesn't get mad with you. He doesn't get angry with you. He doesn't come with a big stick after you and break your head and bring you back or break your leg and bring you back. See, we always bring God to our level. We think in human level and we think God is like you and me, like human beings. So we think God is like that. So that is why we think that when people turn their backs on God, God will pour out his wrath and judgment and just punish them and break their heads and break their legs. But God is not like that, my friend. It's not how it works like that. God doesn't always pour out his judgments. Sometimes he pours out his judgment in history to teach man that if you sin, 
there is a judgment that is why he poured it out at times there now and again he did it there to remind man you can't go on sinny you can't go on living like this because you will be judged in eternity but not every time so this is how we need to understand it the more you turn your back on god and the more you walk away from him the more what you are inviting decline deterioration that is how it is here you turned your back on god you walked away from him you walked away from his love his care his protection his provision you just went away from his protection you walked out of his protection there so that is what is happening here so the more you walk away from him the more you invite that means you give room for the enemy you are inviting the enemy you are saying well my doors are open come and do whatever you want lo are you listening it's not that god is punishing and god is pouring his judgment no no when you turn your back and walk away from him you are inviting the enemy you are inviting decline it's like you are sending an invitation to your enemy and say well decline come deterioration come that is exactly what happened to the nation of israel they turned their backs on god walking after foreign gods serving them the more further they went away from god the more they declined spiritually morally in civilization in every aspect they declined there and the more they began to deteriorate there they wither and you die spiritually that is what happens for anybody not just for israel even you and me today as believers if you turn your back on god and you walk away from him and continue to live in sin and just you know go on in that way there god will not come and break your head there or break your leg and bring you back no no the more you go away from him the more you are inviting the enemy you are opening up to the enemy there and you are inviting decline you are inviting deterioration there you will become fruitless you will wither and you will die spiritually this is what happens this is what happens to many people they turn their backs on god and they walk away from god for years they are not connected with god they walk away from god you can just tell by the way they live and the way they talk that they are totally out of touch with god not connected with god they are dead spiritually i remember in the bible college uh when i was studying there was a colleague of mine he was much younger to me uh very young and he, he, you know at that time when we were studying he already had a ministry he was doing children's ministry he had a church also and doing very well at a very young age not even 21 he was at that time i think very young person doing very well good ministry and then he went to another place a uh, big place there one of the states in tamil nadu established a church and i remember going and preaching in his church where at that time were around i, th- I think at least 200 people were there you know in just a few years which was quite good there we ha- uh, had a seminar a teaching seminar i went there and i preached and i saw people from all walks of life i saw you know fam- uh, people who were teachers people who were doctors all coming to his church very good preacher very young person and at that time himself he used to preach better than me but after a few years i don't know what happened he lost his ministry you know i don't know he also couldn't say what happened he, he never really said or what happened to him and i lost contact with him for many years there he lost his ministry he lost everything and then you know maybe after 10 years or something somehow i got in touch with him and you know what this is what he told me he says if i get a chance i will do ministry again so i said okay 10 years what were you doing did you go to any church he says no did you spend time with the bible no what were you doing 10 years he was totally cut off from god and from god's word and every word that he spoke showed that he was totally spiritually dry no spiritual life in him so i told him suppose if i help you to have a church again and if you start preaching again what will you preach 
I will tell you what you will preach. You will go there and you will preach about your suffering and what you went through and your hardships. You will never preach about the goodness and the blessings of God. You will only preach about what you've gone through because your heart and your mind is filled with that. So I suggest to him, you first take time off. You take the word, fill yourself with the word there. Get spiritual life. See, whatever you have in you, that is what you'll give. If you have problems, you will give problems only to people. You will find people talk, you know, many preachers talking about problems only. They will talk about their problems, their finances, their problems there. Why? Because there's nothing else there. They're empty, they're dry. So you can tell when a person is spiritually dried up, when there's nothing in him there. So this is what happens. When you turn your back on God and you walk away from him, you invite the enemy you invite declination, you invite deterioration and what happens over a period of time, the further you walk away from God, you wither and you die spiritually. This is what happens. This is what happened to Israel and this is what happens to you and me. You die spiritually. God doesn't pour his judgment and wrath upon you. No, no, you just invite everything into your life. You allow everything to come. Because you stepped away from God. You said, I don't want your protection. I don't want your providence. I don't want your healing. I'll just go live my way. I'll worship other gods. You said it. So you invite everything there. This is how we need to understand it. Now you may wonder why if you turn your back on God, you're on the progress to decline and spiritual Death, not, not spiritual death. Spiritually you become dry. Why? Because God is the source of life. That's the reason. John chapter 1 verse 4, John says, In him was life and that life was the light of men. God is the source of life. See, it's not because you turn your back and God, God punishes you and pours a judgment. No, no. He is the source of life. He is a life giver. Life flows from him. He not only created all things there and gives life to all things, he even upholds all things. He is the one who sustains all things by his life. He gives life to all things. If you and me are alive today, it is because he gives life. Life flows from him. He is the source of life. If you read uh, the creation story, you will understand this. You will see a principle there. Whatever God created from whatever he created, that, create, that created thing had to remain connected to its source. So he looked at the waters and he spoke to the waters and he says, let there be fish, variety of fish, of all kinds of fish. And fish was there. Fish came. He spoke to what? He spoke to the waters and told the waters to give forth variety of fish. And fish came. That's how he created the fish there. Now you take the fish and you put it on a land, what will happen to it? It will die, isn't it? Why? It has to remain attached and connected to its source. It was created to live in the water, not to live in the land. The moment you take it from the water and put it on the land, from that moment onwards, it begins to die. It's just a matter of time when it will die fully. I can go on. Trees, he spoke to the ground. Let it bring forth herbs and trees of different kinds. Then. That is why a tree has to remain connected to the earth, to the ground. You take a tree from the ground, separate it and sever it from the ground, it dies. And then finally he comes to man. But how did he create man? He did not speak, he did not create man like how he created the fish and the trees and the animals. No, no, when he created man, he did not say, let there be man. Just now he said, let there be fish, let there be birds. No, no. He didn't say, let there be man and woman. The Bible says there that God spoke to himself there. He said, let us, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit communing with each other there. Let us make man in our image and our likeness there. That means man is created just like God. He came out from God. His source is God. He came from God. He received his life from God. God breathed into him the breath of life. He received life from God. God is life. He is a life giver. 
man received his life from God. So that's his source. So if man is to continue to remain and have life, I'm not talking about physical life, I'm talking about spiritual life, God's life, then you need to remain in him and you need to abide in him and you need to stay connected to him. Then only his life will flow in you. See, when you turn your back on him and when you cut yourself on him and you begin to walk away from him, life stops flowing from you and that is why you invite decline and you invite deterioration. You invite spiritual dryness. You wither and you dry spiritually. You are the cause, not God. Sometimes you either blame God for everything, if not blame the devil. <laughs> we never take responsibility for our faults. We always like to blame people. We either blame God or we blame the devil. Your declination is not because of God. He is not punishing you. He is not withholding anything from you. No, no. The Bible says God delights in blessing his people. A thousand times, a million times you go to him and ask, God is never sick and tired of giving because he giveth and giveth and giveth and giveth. He is a God who gives graciously. So he is never tired of giving. You and me may be tired of giving, but not God. So it's not his problem, it is our problem. We have cut off ourselves from the source of life. He is life. Life flows from him. He is the creator of life. He is the source of life. He sustains all life. Life flows from him to everyone and to everything there. And the moment I cut myself off from life, that is when I stop receiving life. And the further I go away from him, the further I invite declination and deterioration. Now you understand who is the source of all the problems. Not God, my friend. You and me. Amen? That is what we do sometimes. We don't listen to him. We turn our backs on him. We just keep walking in our way then. And you walk in your way. What happens? You invite decline. You invite the enemy into your life. Turn with me to John chapter 15. I'll read first to verse 4. Abide in me. And I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the wine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now here, these are the words of Jesus. If you have a good Bible, it will be in red there. That means these are the words of Jesus. Jesus is teaching this. And is using an earthly example. He's using the picture of a wine. You know, one of the reasons why Jesus was so famous in his teachings and uh, people understood his teachings very well because he used the daily things of life which people saw and were associated with. He used those things to explain spiritual truths. He used the birds of the air. He used the lily of the valley. And here now he uses the wine. Israel was very famous for wine. Wine and figs and honey. So he uses the wine plant because he knows that every Israelite will understand this. So this is what he's talking. He's talking about a wine and the branches. Now, the branch does not have life of its own. It receives nourishment and life only from the wine. So that is why the branch has to be connected. See, we understand this. If, we, if I show you a wine plant and I show you a branch, you understand it because you are seeing something. So every branch has to be connected to the wine because the branch does not have life in itself. It cannot produce life by itself. Only the wine has life in itself. Who is the wine? Jesus. He has life in himself. Nobody created him. Nobody gives him life. That is what the first thing we saw. He is the self-existing God. Nobody created him. Nobody gave, gives him life. He has life in himself and because he has himself. He can give life to everyone and to everything. He is the life giver. So the branch does not have life of itself. That is why it is totally dependent upon the wine. It has to remain in the wine. Has to be connected to the wine. And only if it remains and connected to the wine, the life that is in the wine will flow through the branch. And you know what? The more longer the branch is connected to the wine, the more the life that is in the wine flows into the branch. And they say, 
that the branch, because it receives life of the wine, over a period of time, the branch and the wine look alike. Isn't that wonderful? The branch is receiving life. What life? Life from the wine. So over the period of time, the branch looks just like the wine. That is exactly what has been talking about here. You understand how a branch has to be connected to the wine. But the problem is, you are asking me, how can I be connected to God? <laughs> that is what he starts here. He says, I am the wine, you are the branches. He starts it out like that in John chapter 15. I am the true wine and my father is a wine dresser. And in verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So here he says very clearly that he is the wine and we are the branches. Now come down to verse 4. He says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So Jesus is plainly stating this. He's saying, unless you abide, remain in me or continue in me, you cannot bear fruit of yourself. The branch cannot bring forth fruit of itself. It needs life from the wine. Unless the life that is in the wine flows in the branch, only then the branch can produce fruit. If life in the wine does not flow through the branch, then the branch cannot produce any fruit by itself. So that is why he says, abide in me. Abide in me. Abide in me means remain in me, continue in me. Now what is he talking about? Now the question naturally arises, how can I remain in God? <laughs> how can I abide in God? Well, how can I be connected with God? The only way you and me can abide in God and remain in God and connected with God is through his word. Are you listening? It's through his word. Because God has put his life in the word. That is why he says, my words, later on he'll talk about the word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you will. So how do I abide in Christ? How do I remain in God? How do I continue my life in God? How do I connect with God every day? It is through the word because God has put his life in the word. So every day as I spend time with God and as I read the word of God and as I meditate the word of God, you know, I'm connected with God. God's life keeps flowing to me through his word. That is what he's saying. Abide in me. Remain in me. Because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You cannot bring forth fruit. You have to abide. You have to remain in me. Unless you abide and remain in me, then the life that is in me will flow into you. So there is life in the word. God's life. He put his life in this word. And the more you remain in the word, the more you're connected in the word, and the more you keep abiding in the word and spending time in the word there, the more you are infused with the life of God. Remember last week I told you about 2 Corinthians 3.18 where Paul says we all with an unveiled, unveiled face behold the glory of God and we are changed from one degree of glory to another degree of glory until we are conformed to the image of Jesus. What is he talking about? He's talking about how we are changed into the very image of Christ. God had started a good work in you and me and he'll complete it. The Bible talks about how we'll be transformed and we'll become one day just like Jesus. One day we'll be just like him. But the work has already started now. Every day as you keep looking at the word, you are being changed from the inside out. Change and transformation takes from the inside out. Last week I showed you that. From one degree to another degree, until you are conformed to the image of Christ. That means until you become just like Christ. John says we don't know how we will be. But one thing we'll know. We will be like him. <laughs> that is what it's talking about. So verse 4. Abide in me. That means my word. And I in you. Let my word abide in you. We looked at these things in detail when I done John chapter 15. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Unless it abides in the wine. Neither can you unless you abide in the wine. That means... Unless you remain in the word and continue in the word, you cannot bring forth fruit of yourself. Is that plain and simple? Hello? The secret to success, victory, and prosperity is abiding and remaining and continuing in God's word. That is simple, my friend. 
people think prosperity you know people are mad against prosperity teaching if you tell you are coming from here they say oh that's a prosperity church they think prosperity is leaving god and running after money <laughs> they think that is what we are doing here no no week after week i teach you how to put god first honor god first not money first i don't tell you to put money first i don't tell you leave god and leave his word and run after money no no i teach you how to put god first honor god first seek god first and all the other things that you need will come upon you and overtake you that is prosperity that is total well being prosperity peace joy happiness health you know everything success and victory comes as a result where you spend time in the word when you remain in the word and continue in the word of god why because the more you spend time with the god with, with the word of god the more the life of god flows in you and through you god's kind of life was god defeated hello did jesus have a headache a stomach ache <laughs> no no did he have lack of want never that is the same type of life that flows through you and me when you spend time with the word you get it my friend that is what he says the branch cannot bring forth fruit by itself because it does not have life the life that you have the very breath that you breathe where does it come from it comes from god he is the one who gives it to you so i need god i need to connect to god i need to remain in him i cannot cut off from him then the branch cannot bear fruit it is useless it is totally dependent upon god the branch has to be connected to the vine only then the life that is in the vine flows to the branch and then the branch produces fruit same with you and me that is what is talking about here you and me need to be connected with god why because he is the source of life and how can i be connected with god it is through his word so the more you spend time in the word the more you are filled with his life because his life is in the word just like how the branch over a period of time becomes just like the wine you are filled with the life of god that you become just like christ you begin to live like him you begin to talk to him you begin to have authority like him that's what is talking about was five i am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and i in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing i think even lkg students should understand this <laughs> very plain very simple god says by yourself you can do nothing you cannot bring forth fruit you need me you need to be connected to me you need to remain in me because i am the source of life you need life you need to be connected to me but you know what we do we all leave god and we try to do our own things <laughs> we we leave god and we run after money we run after this we run after everything see this is what happens when you turn your back on god god doesn't get angry with you he doesn't get mad with you he doesn't break your hand and leg or you know put sickness and disease bring cancer no no he doesn't do all that he's a god of love yes he chastises he corrects you when you walk away from him when you turn but the thing is when you turn your back away from god and you walk away from him you know what happens you are cutting off yourself from the source of life the further away you go from him the further you decline the further you deteriorate there you wither you become spiritually dry and you invite the enemy into your life you invite all sorts of things into your life this is how things happen to you and me it's not because of god not even because of the devil you invited everything <laughs> you sent out an invitation welcome my enemy welcome decline welcome deterioration you sent it out how you sent it out by turning your back on god and walking away from him and choosing another doctor just like how we do when we are sick <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church Christ has been you know it's talking about Christ there which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all 
what it, in essence what it is talking about here is talking about how Christ is the head of the church and the church is the body that means all the members everywhere all over the world are the body we compromise the body different parts some are hands some are legs some are fingers some are toes and all we are the body but Christ is the head and it's talking about how because he is the head the life that is in the head flows to the body that is what it's saying here. he fills all in all that means he fills the body he fills every member of his body with his life because he is the head you know some people say i am the small toe of my you know why they say they think they are so insignificant they think they are nothing well god says doesn't matter that small toe also my life flows through that <laughs> So Christ is the head of the church and the church is the body. We are all members there of the body there and his life flows to the body. That means it flows through every member of the body. Christ's life flows through you. It flows through me there. But when does it flow? As long as you are connected to the head, isn't it? <laughs> If your body is severe from the head, then life that is in the head cannot flow through the body that is why the body has to remain connected to the head there only then what christ is he can fill the body with his that is why paul says you know he has become our wisdom our righteousness our power what is he saying in other words he is saying all christ is you and me are a very hard truth for christians to accept <laughs> all christ is you and me are they don't want to accept that because if they accept that it will change and transform them but that is the truth whatever christ is you and me are the body is why because it's the same life that flows in christ flows in us the same life flows through us through the body there 1 john chapter 4 verse 9 in this the love of god was manifested towards us that god has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him now notice this carefully god sent his only begotten son into this world that we might what live how through him <laughs> hello <laughs> we live through him apart from him you cannot live no life because he is the source of life that is what jesus says i am come that you may have life in all its fullness he is the life giver he is the source of life so he's saying he come to that we may live through him the only way you and me can live and have life is through jesus because he is the source of life life flows from him and i tell you as long as we are connected to god or to jesus through his word his life flows in and through us that's why it's important to spend time with the word people don't understand the importance and the significance and how it changes and transforms you and makes you just like Christ but this is what happens when you spend time with the word because God's life is in the word there and the more you spend time in the word the more the life of God gets into you you are infused with God's life and the more you are infused with God's life the more you begin to live just like Jesus you live in victory you live in authority you live in power you live in success you always rise above every circumstance and problem that you face here so we live through him the moment you cut off yourself you die spiritually you wither now it is in this particular situation that the nation of israel they turn their backs on god walked away from god embraced foreign gods and the more they began to walk away from god the more they experienced decline deterioration and you know what happened they became spiritually immorally declination was there and civilization and culture also began to decline everything began to decline and deteriorate it is during this time that was happening to israel that god comes to a prophet called jeremiah and reveals a, to jeremiah this name called the lord our righteousness decline uh, israel is in a state of deterioration and decline in every way spiritually morally 
civilization, every way, they are declined there. And God comes to them and reveals this name, the Lord, our righteousness, to Jeremiah. But you know how he begins? Jeremiah chapter 23. Today I'll just comment on it. And next week, this is what we're going to look at. It's going to be very interesting. So Israel turned their backs on God, walked away from God, embracing foreign gods, and just living as they wish and as they decide to do their thing. So tremendous decline, spiritually, morally, civilization, everything, great de de decline in culture also. So how God deals with it in verse 23, this is shocking. 23 verse 1, what does it say? How does God begin? It says, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. I'll talk about this next week in detail. But the thing is this. Israel as a nation has declined in every aspect. Spiritually, morally, civilization, culture. They have declined tremendously there. And you know what? God addresses the leaders of the nation of Israel. He starts with the leaders. He holds the leaders responsible for the declination of Israel as a nation then. Why he holds the leaders? Because the church is God's spiritual garment here. The church is God's spiritual garment. So if there is a decline in Christianity, if there is a de decline in Christian immorality, Christians become immoral in civilization, in culture, if, de if there is a decline in Christianity, then God addresses the leaders. He holds the leaders responsible for the decline in Christianity. I'm going to talk about this next week. And here he's holding the leaders of the nation of Israel. He says, woe unto you, shepherds. Because God has put them in charge of the sheep there. They were supposed to feed and care and nurture and take care of the sheep there. But they have failed in their duties. And that is the result of the declination of the nation of Israel. And that is why God begins by dealing with them and holding them responsible there. He holds the shepherds responsible. Even today it's the same. Whether it is secular or spiritual. In the secular world, if there is immorality, if there is declination and deterioration, then God holds the secular government responsible. In the spiritual world, if there is decline in Christianity, then God holds, same the leaders. Because it is their responsibility to lead the nation in righteousness, in truth. That is why God holds the leaders responsible. Well, this we'll talk about next week. Shall we all stand this morning? Remember, we are not talking about our own righteousness. We are talking about the righteousness that comes from God. And more than anything else, remember that he is the source of life. He is the source of life. You want to be successful. You want to be victorious. You want to enjoy good health. You want to be blessed in every aspect of your life. Then it's simple. You just abide in the word. You remain in the word. Continue in the word. As you abide and remain and continue the word, the Bible says, you will be fruitful. Because the life of the wine will flow to the branch and the branch will begin to produce fruit. That's the only way you and me can be fruitful, my friend. There is no success, no victory, no prosperity, no health, no fruitfulness apart from God's word. We have to stay connected to him because he is the source of life. The only way I can connect to him, stay connected to him is through the word. Abide in his word. Remain in his word. Continue in the word. Let his life flow through me. Let his life flow in me and through me to others also. Shall we just lift up our hearts and our voices to God? Just thank him for his word. So spend time with the word. It's never a waste of time. You'll be rewarded richly and abundantly. You'll be blessed for it in every aspect. Thank you, Father. Oh, we just worship you, Lord worship you. Father God, once again, we thank you for these wonderful truths we learn, oh God. Precious truths, life-changing, life-transforming truths, oh God. And thank you for the simple key of success, oh God. The key to stay 
in your word remain in your word never to depart from your word to always keep your word before our eyes and to walk before it aka yes father i pray that every person will realize aka the secret to peace and joy and happiness and health and prosperity is remaining in your word and abiding in your word aka and i pray that as they spend time with your word that the life that there is in your word flow through them aka yes father let your life flow through them aka and let it bring forth fruit in their lives aka for this is what you said aka but as we abide in you and your word abides in us the branch shall bear forth much fruit aka so i pray aka that every person as they remain and continue in your word become much fruitful in their lives aka continue to produce fruit more and more and more aka every aspect of the life aka. Yes father heaven and earth may pass away but your words will never pass away your words will never return void aka your words will bring fruit in the lives of people aka may it make people fruitful cause people be, to be fruitful aka not just 30 60 but 100 fold oh father come at each and every one of us into your hands may you continue to lead us and guide us bless us and make us a channel of blessing to this nation in jesus name i pray Amen.